Well, I, I, one thing I will give Sandy is that he knows how to have an entrance. We, uh, Cliss and I both want to apologize because um, we, had, we were on an airplane which was going to land with plenty of time uh, and then learned this morning that the airplane wasn't going to leave. Um, and I do want to say a brief commercial for American Airlines. Uh, that was not their airplane, but they happened to have a plane, instead of flying direct from Washington, they had a plane through Dallas. And they went overboard to get us here, make the connections. We had a barely legal connection in Dallas. And uh, they, uh, they did everything they could to be really helpful. In fact, our luggage didn't make the connection, so it's on the way here now. Uh, and then we just even had a few more complications. So we apologize for running late. Uh, and I particularly want to say to those of you who were in the reception earlier that we always enjoy having a chance to see you and we apologize and hope we'll be able to at least get a picture or say something out front later on. <clears throat> now, I, I don't think I quite realized it had been 12 times that we had been here. But it has always meant a lot to me to come here. Uh, the first presidential campaign I ever really got involved in as a volunteer was the Nixon Lodge campaign in 1960. And for those of you who may sometimes despair of Republicans in California, I might point out to you that in Georgia in 1960, the number of people who were willing to publicly campaign for Richard Nixon <clears throat> or for any Republican was a remarkably small number. We held no state legislative offices outside the mountains, and the seats we had in the mountains were a function of the Civil War. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so if you just start with there, you can understand. My, my whole career has been a series of climbing mountains, uh, and, and that was one of the longest political nights of my life, listening uh, as the Democrats stole Texas and uh, uh, Illinois uh, in what was a remarkably close election. So. I always come out here with, with a lot of different emotions, and I'm glad to be here tonight. And I'm going to talk about American exceptionalism uh, really in three bites. You know, to, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Callista's been doing, which is aimed at teaching four to eight year olds about American exceptionalism and about American history, uh, something which we tragically find more and more of our young people are not learning in school, and so they need help learning it. Then I'm going to talk briefly about uh, Lincoln. Uh, and tomorrow's 150th anniversary of what may have been one of the most important speeches in American history, and in many ways one of the most important speeches in human history, because it described a standard that we should meet. And then I'm going to talk about breakout, which in some ways is the culmination of my 55 years, <clears throat> going back to 1958, of trying to understand what we need to do as a country. And in 58, my dad, who was stationed in France, uh, convinced me that uh, somebody had to take responsibility for understanding what America had to do, for learning how to explain it so the American people would give you permission to do it, and then for knowing how to implement it if they gave you permission. Uh, and I think that that's a very important model. And Breakout is probably the most important book I've written because it's an effort to really recenter the system and to say to adults, just as Calista is saying to children, here's how we got to be an exceptional nation. Breakout is designed to say to adults, Here's how we can continue to be an exceptional nation. And if you do read it and you do think it's important, I hope you'll uh, use uh, Facebook and Twitter and email addresses and what have you uh, and try to spread the word because I think the more people we can get telling each other, the better off we're going to be because the scale of this change I'm going to describe can only come from the grassroots up. It, would, it will never come from Sacramento. It will never come from Washington. It's impossible to ask bureaucrats and politicians and lobbyists to get together to voluntarily disarm, uh, and they're not going to do it. And so the only way you're going to get change on that scale is to run over them by arousing the American people to a point where they have no choice. And you saw a little bit of that this last week when 39 Democrats suddenly decided that Republican Congressman Fred Upton had a terrific idea. <laughs> so, Close and I were very fortunate. We did uh, both a book and a movie about Ronald Reagan. And there's a great line where Reagan says that his real job was to show the light to the American people so they would turn up the heat on Congress. Uh, and I think maybe that's uh, breakout is in that tradition. If we get enough Americans to decide this is the right direction, they will eventually get their political uh, figures to follow. A leadership is often a function of figuring out where the parade is going and trying to get in it, uh, as opposed to actually leading it. 
So let me start with what Clist has been doing. Alice the Elephant is a time-traveling pachyderm uh, who is, and he's not a Republican pachyderm. He, he, is a, he, is a, he is a four to eight year old universal pachyderm, okay? Uh, and, and we were at a Costco Saturday signing books. And if you had seen these little kids, we have a, somebody who plays Ellis. If you had seen these little kids running up to Ellis, you'd have understood exactly why she invented this character. But her goal has been uh, first uh, to talk about all of American history and then to talk about the colonial period, and now in Yankee Doodle Dandy, to, to talk about the American Revolution. And she's already beginning to work on a book for next year, which will be called From Sea to Shining Sea, in which Ellis helps uh, Lewis and Clark uh, go to the Pacific. And, and, our, and her goal is, and this is, by the way, very hard. I've, uh, Breakout is my 27th book. Uh, and I can tell you that watching her write the Ellis series, when you have to take facts and we're, in, in a small C sense, conservative in that we actually want our history books to be factual, uh, which is, I think, a very useful model. Um, <laughs> when you take, have to take a set of facts that you think four to eight-year-olds can understand, and then you have to describe them in rhyme so it's easy for them to remember. And then with the help of her terrific uh, artist, uh, Susan Arciero, you've got to have a scene which explains what the rhyme is describing. Um, each of her page sections is the equivalent of one of my chapters in effort. I mean, it is, I didn't know this when she first started. I thought, oh, this would be great, you know, write kids books. Well, it turns out to be really important. But it's extraordinarily important the young Americans learn why we are, in fact, an exceptional nation. <laughs> now, it's interesting, and in fact, very appropriate to talk about Yankee Doodle Dandy for a second, because, of, of course, if you're going to describe the American Revolution, you are describing the Declaration of Independence. And what makes tomorrow's anniversary of Lincoln's speech so special is that it is at Gettysburg in a two-minute speech <clears throat> that Lincoln really reunites the country with the Declaration of Independence. For most of our first 100 years or 80 years of our history, the Constitution had been the dominant document. Uh, it was the document which framed our law, it was the document which let people looked at in terms of what does it mean to be an American and how are we going to structure this very complex country. Lincoln comes along and Lincoln says, the Constitution defines the structure of who we are, but the Declaration of Independence describes the spirit of who we are. And I think it's peculiarly important in the current presidency, and I, I, by the way, think it was entirely appropriate that President Obama did not go to Gettysburg, um, because I think that there's almost nothing in his current pattern which would be, which would be worthy of being near Abraham Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> and, and I... I don't want to be partisan, but I, I do think it's very important to look in context. Lincoln was all about the rule of law. Lincoln understood as somebody who had, had grown up very poor, who had only had about a year and a half of schooling, who had literally learned how to read by the light of a fireplace because his family couldn't afford candles. And Lincoln understood that it is the rule of law which protects the weak. It is the rule of law which protects the average person. That without the rule of law, it is the predators, the vicious, and the powerful. And so he saw what we were fighting over as the very essence of freedom and whether or not freedom would survive. And he goes to Gettysburg. This war had gotten much longer, much bloodier, much more difficult than anybody expected. Everybody thought it was a 30 to 90 day war. And Lincoln is having to explain to the